Board Gamers Anonymous, Episode 90. This week's feature, Essen, Acquisition Disorder. This episode was brought to you by our Patreon backer, Zane. He saved us all a seat at the table. So check out our Patreon account, and maybe next time it could be you. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Daniel. And this is Drew. Welcome to the episode, everyone. So glad to have you join us again this week at the table. We are going to be talking about Essen 2015. All the games that we want really, 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 really far away in Germany. But nonetheless, we still want them and we're going to be talking about them this week. We got a great episode. We're going to be talking about Power Grid, the stock companies, the Manhattan Project, Energy Empire, Argo, and especially a new game that's on Kickstarter, Campaign Trail. But before we get into all of that, Anthony has an announcement on our newsletter sign up. Hey guys, so if you have not yet, go to the website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. There's a giant red button on the right side of the page. You cannot miss it. I made it really big on purpose. You cannot miss it. And click on that, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, every week you're going to get an email that has all the stuff we did this week. So it'll have a link to the newest episode, which presumably you've already heard if you're listening to this. As well as, you know, any blog posts we put up. Information about Extra Life, which is coming up very soon. And this year, you guys are going to be able to be involved in that. Everybody, regardless of location. So make sure you stay tuned on that. And then contests. So there are going to be contests we're going to run on there as well. That will be just for people on the newsletter. As well as some cool stuff in terms of new episode ideas coming up. So if you're on the newsletter, you get access to all that cool stuff. It's free once a week. Lots of cool stuff coming down the pike from that. So definitely check that out on the website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. Let's get on to the episode. Drew, why don't you shout it from the tabletop? Shout it from the tabletops! (laughs) Sir, you're going to need to get down from there. Hey, thanks, Chris. On Shout It, we take a closer look at some of the, the news items that we send out recently. On our BGA Twitter feed, BGA Podcast. So check it out every day, Monday through Saturday. First of all, Canada's premier board game cafe, I'm sure you've heard of it, Snakes and Lattes, has moved to bigger and better digs. There are really cool photographs of their new place in Toronto, and I'll link to them. This is big to me because in our predictions for 2015, Chris, remember I said cafes would be big? Well, this is the biggest one, and it's leading the way. We're going to see some more cafes I'm sure, setting up and growing. Second bit of news I wanted to cover with you that I'm sure you've heard about. Wizards of the Coast and Cryptozoic settled the suit that they had over Cryptozoic's game Hex Shards of Fate. You could kindly describe it as a clone of Magic the Gathering. At least that's how Wizards saw it. So they uh, they were just protecting their property. And uh, basically all they said was it's been settled, licenses have been paid, and they're happy to see Cryptozoic move forward with Hex Shards of Fate. Now, Hex got over $2 million from their Kickstarter this year. How much of that do you think went to Wizards in the settlement? Or do you think it was a percentage deal? Are they getting like a certain percentage of every card sold? It's not a bad deal for Wizards. I remember it was kind of a big thing when Wizards chased them off of the market, but I imagine if I were Cryptozoic anyway, I would have fought for a sort of very limited license, not one that would eat into my profit constantly because presumably this game is going to continue to grow and expand right like these kinds of games tend to Uh, so you wouldn't want to pay out of pocket you know pay pay a percentage every time you sell it when you could just pay it up front if you yeah it would have been nice Uh, the the details were not forthcoming in this but they did use the word license one thing that told me is it's going to be a percentage deal or or like a certain amount of money per whatever the wizard said oh we we certainly promote our game but we encourage our players to try out other games too well yeah they can try out other games as long as wizards is getting a piece of that action too anthony you're a follower of geek dad aren't you i love what he does i have his book around here somewhere full of awesome ideas for when my son is old enough to do them them there are a lot of people that go under that name geek dad it's it's really cool one one fellow rory bristol is teaching his steps on how to play magic the gathering so he wrote an interesting series 
on uh, a primer, basically on learning the game. But one of the the chapters of that online primer, and I'll have the the link for you, is buying and selling cards, magic cards specifically, but all TCG cards in general. Uh, it's it really fascinating to read it. Like even though I don't play magic, it sort of got me wanting to. <laughs> Try it out, buy a couple packs and see what I could find. You guys ever feel tempted to buy cards just to look for ultra rares that you can flip? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you yes. Oh. Yeah, actually, I uh, I bought a starter set of Magic, oh, I don't know, maybe two years ago when I was like waffling between getting into the uh, board game hobby and pulled out whatever the, the big hot super rare was in that set. Um, one of the uh, Planeswalkers, and then immediately sold it because I had no interest in playing the game, but, you know, doubled the money I spent on the starter deck. So that was cool. It was fun. It was a nice little rush. Oh, so you have uh, you have some experience in this, man. We'll, uh... No, I got super lucky, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. It's just being smart enough to know what's rare and how to sell it for the most money. So it's, it's an interesting uh, series. I'll post that. Forbes magazine. You know, they have a columnist that reports on the hobby industry, but they also did an article specifically about called The New Loneliness of Video Games. It's something we've heard before, how, how unsocial gamers are becoming through video games because of the loss of the split screen. It was interesting to see a major magazine take a look at our hobby. Uh, the article made the point that even VR, virtual reality, is only going to make this trend worse it's becoming so unsocial. And what the, the writer Paul Tassi said was this trade-off of technology for you know, the loss of social interaction is not worth it. Better graphics and more complexity are not worth the complete destruction of local co-op gaming, which is why we fell in love with games in the first place. Unquote. So are we board gamers snickering with glee every time something like this comes up? Is this a, a really good sign or just a small side issue? I mean, it's definitely one of the things that draws me to board games over video games. And it was actually kind of interesting. I had a group of friends who I played all sorts of games with from college on. And I had that great epiphany moment. I was like, hey, guys, you know, I think I'm actually a board and tabletop gamer more than a video gamer. And one of my friends is looking at me and well, duh. Because didn't you realize this all along? But for me, right, in college and before that, every time I played video games, I would be with my friends in the same room. Ideally, it would be hot seat, right, or, you know, on a console with multiple yeah. controllers or hot seat on a computer, like Heroes of Might and Magic style. But even when that became less possible, we would all be on our computers in the same place, right? It's not technically a local area network, but whatever. I'm going to use the term LAN party because that's, you know, gets the image across. Sure. And that was really what I enjoyed about gaming, right? You're there with your friends in gaming, but... That doesn't happen very much anymore with video games, especially as you, you know, grow up and grow apart and you don't have <laughs> as many roommates and all that. But board gaming, right, you're going to be together at the table. And that that's huge. I love that. Yeah, I think we're going to pick up more and more people as time goes on. The, the more they try to build the technology into this, yeah, they're going to make a lot of money selling the technology and selling some of the games. But I think it's, it's going to lose some luster at some point. It's going to continue to. Because you need that social interaction. Um, here's something, Daniel, you might be familiar with. Korean messaging app, Kakao. Is, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, I, I, I believe so anyway. That's how I heard it pronounced when I was over there, yeah. <laughs> they plan to add online board games that allow gambling between opponents. And this is a quote from the article. Many of the games will feature elements of online gambling. Users purchase game money and play each other using that money. It's, it's interesting to think about this because Kakao, when I, when I was over in Korea, is huge. Everybody constantly uses it, and I still have that little Kakao sound in my head it makes when <laughs> you have a new message just ringing in my head. And I didn't even have this app because I didn't bring my, my smartphone with me. And so right, I didn't even have this thing, and I heard that sound so many times that it just burned into my brain forever. Uh, so this is a pretty big, pretty big thing. This is big news. Yeah, it would be what, like uh, Messenger or something, allowing you to play uh, games, yeah, or um, yeah. what? WhatsApp, some big messaging app, definitely. I'm curious though, what games would you guys feel confident enough to wager on? Ooh, I don't know. I kind of feel like wagering on games in a serious way ruins the fun for me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a while back when I was 
when I was younger, I played uh, Magic the Gathering a lot, and I'd play with my friends, and we did do wagers sometimes, but it was always the form of, like, top card of the deck goes down as the bet. And we had a mutual understanding of if either of us turned over a card that was really important to us or was way more valuable than the other one, we'd be like, yeah, that one doesn't count. But any serious wagering just takes the fun out of the game for me. Because uh, now it's about money, you know? And if I really wanted to make the money, I'd just go work at a job. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, it's one thing to play penny ante poker with a bunch of friends around a table. But once you start using electronics, like doing this on an app, um, there's the friendliness is gone. It's a very cold-blooded, you know, you lose your money, I get it, ha. Um, yeah. But still, there's a lot of fun. Uh, the head-to-head games like Backgammon is all about wagering. The, the doubling cube is actually, uh, um, I think, a pretty in- impressive way to make gambling interesting in a game. I don't know if America will eventually pass laws allowing that, but the fact that there's one country starting there, it may pass on. Moving on, Kickstarter has reorganized to prove that its mission is about more than just making money. Do you really see them as a company or corporation that benefits the public? I mean, they've certainly allowed a lot of small firms that wouldn't have been able to gather any sort of significant funds or any significant capital to gather capital and expand and stay open. So there is that, and you know, then that leads to employment, right? And small businesses are, as every politician is going to say on the campaign trail, right, the lifeblood of America. So there's that, and some of the products that have been produced are legitimately very significant for the quality of life, right, across the world, right? They can do some really cool things. Uh, But at the same time, I mean, let's not pretend that they're not taking, what, 10%? Yeah, it's a good chunk. I mean, that's, that's not huge, but it's not nothing. So, yeah, they're benefiting the world, but, and again, isn't that not that supposed to be not that special right that's what companies are supposed to do they offer a product that benefits someone for a price i don't actually understand how a public benefit corporation differs from a standard corporation but that doesn't mean they don't qualify as one and maybe there is a real difference but it just sounds to me like they are highlighting the fact that they're doing something that society wants them but you know frito-lays does that too right they make a product people (laughs) want they buy it they get happy I mean, sure, it may not be the healthiest for them, but, you know, not everything on Kickstarter is life-saving medical equipment. A lot of it's games, which I don't mind, but, you know, might not be life-saving. And, you know, weird little, like, organizational boxes and stuff that are just, yeah, all right. Okay, more stuff to sell at Walmart. One final bit of news I thought was really interesting. Uh, High School in Minnesota. They created a live version of Hungry Hungry Hippos. Now, you know I love giant versions. They actually did this in like a school gymnasium. Teams of people working together. You know how Hungry Hungry Hippos works. They put a a bunch of little balls around the floor, and these teams of players, one of them is laying down on a cart with a laundry basket trying to trap these balls, and the other two people are, are pushing them around the floor trying to capture them. I love the idea of creating a live version of some of these classic old games it's more than just a giant version of it it's actually just making a human version of it so be sure please to check uh, bga's twitter feed mondays through saturdays for the latest news in the gaming world that's bga podcast you know i'm actually going to have to leave you guys for a few minutes the soviets are in guatemala again and i've got to lay down some nato on them so we don't go to defcon one so uh, i gotta save central america i'll try to catch up with you guys in the final round good luck with your twilight struggle group And now, our Acquisition Disorders. Acquisition Disorders? That's crazy! Only needs the base game, nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion, see? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game and the expansion and the promos and, of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion, the promos, and the upgraded components. See? That's not too much. All right, now on to our Acquisition Disorders. We're going to talk about some great games that we absolutely, positively must get to the table. Anthony, why don't you start us off? All right, I'm I'm gonna do it. This is a uh, this is a game that I love, and I've actually recently got to the table a couple times for the first time in a long time. For some reason, this is a game people either love or hate, and when you find a group of people who love it, you get to play it often, and I'm very happy about that. Um, and that's Power Grid, and specifically, I got to play the Power Grid Deluxe version and the newest expansion for Power Grid, the Stock Companies, uh, which is a game I'm really eager uh, to get this week. 
is compatible with both the regular version and the deluxe version. So that's exciting because the older expansions are not compatible. You have to get upgrade kits and everything. This one will just be right out of the box. What does the stock companies do? It adds, as you guessed it, variants where you have shares in different stock companies that allow you to acquire wealth. Basically, it turns Power Grid into an 18xx game, um, but in the Freeman Free style, of course. So it is a little bit lighter, a little bit faster, and there's a whole new element of the game there. Um, I, surprising to myself, love these stock uh, acquisition games. I really didn't think I would, and I'd played a couple in the past, but recently I've played a handful of them, and I enjoy it every time. So I think it's going to be really fun to add this to Power Grid, one of my favorite games um, in general, and to kind of have that new element to it. Uh, there are two other variants here. First of the variants, the players are shareholders who try to get shares of the most successful companies. Uh, the companies that supply electricity to the most cities are going to be the most successful ones. It's going to affect scoring in terms of you know who has shares in the most options. And then the second option, the second variant, the each of the players will control their own private stock companies and try to establish them as successful in that market. Um, then they can sell shares of their own companies to get cash um, or buy shares from other people. So it's kind of a, a more direct interaction with players instead of having this kind of open market. Because of all the new options here if you combine that with all the other maps there's just so many different ways to play this game now um, which i love so it's actually kind of reminding me of 504 with the sheer number of different ways you can play this game by interacting different types of modules that's a whole nother level of course but uh, it will definitely open up power grid in a new and exciting way and i uh, cannot wait to get it so that is my acquisition disorder this week i will almost certainly pick it up as soon as it's available here in the states yeah, Anthony, I've got a, a, a game that's been sort of on my radar right now, a game you actually pointed me towards, uh, which is called Argo. It's on Kickstarter right now. And Argo is, I, I hesitate to call it semi-cooperative because it's actually competitive at its core with a little bit of joint loss condition as a potential where the bad stuff happens and everybody dies. But the way the game works is that you each control teams of astronauts uh, in a space station being overrun by aliens, and everyone is trying to get as many of their astronauts to the escape pods as possible while uh, preventing your enemies from preventing you from getting there. Uh, now, there are limited seats in the escape pods, so somebody's going to have to get left behind, and you want to make damn sure it's not you or your friends, right? Uh, so to make sure that it's not you or your friends, uh, each player is given uh, some amount of control over the alien forces, which they can use to kill other astronauts from other teams. Uh, and you get points for doing that as well as for escaping successfully. However, the aliens also get points by themselves. And if the aliens get uh, too powerful, then everybody loses. I think this is a, a pretty interesting idea and the uh, what I've seen of it so far looks like it's going to be very promising. Uh, they haven't put any stretch goals yet because they're waiting until they get the base level funded, which I can understand the philo motivating philosophy, which is, right, we shouldn't try to tease you on with things that might not be in the game. But as a rule, I really do like to see stretch goals before I jump in because, you know, that gives me a, a picture of what the game might be. Uh but it does look like a really interesting game and something worth taking a look at. So if you guys have time, go take a look on Kickstarter. It's, uh, what's the U.S. backing? About $34 U.S. dollars uh, that and 30 euros to back it and get a copy of the game. Looks like a pretty fun time. Uh, and, you know, they're updating pretty regularly, so they'll make sure to have more playthroughs and all of that. So you'll be able to see what you're getting into. Mine is Argo. Yeah, Daniel, the game that I'm looking at this week is very similar to the game that Anthony talked about. It's not an expansion, but it's keeping in the same universe as the previous game. I'm talking about the Manhattan Project Energy Empire. Now, the Manhattan Project, which I talked about a number of times, is a very streamlined worker placement game in which you are building and testing atomic bombs. Now, here you have a game that's actually taking that atomic age to the next level. You're no longer building bombs, and this game is not about war, 
but the same game mechanics are in play here. What you're doing is trying to build an energy empire and you're using worker placement, tableau building, resource management in order to build a tableau and use your workers to activate spots on a main board and then based upon your combination in your tableau of scientific discoveries, you'll be able to produce energy and yet at the same time, hopefully, reduce the harmful effects of industry. So build up this vast mega industry that's producing energy for your people and at the same time take care of pollution, which is amazing. It reminds me of CO2 a little bit, and this is kind of a slimmed down version of this game. Now, unlike the Manhattan Project, the previous kind of main game, this game has dice. So there's going to be some dice rolling as far as energy is concerned that represents nuclear, coal, oil, solar, and other forms of energy. So it adds a little bit more to the game, and I like that. And Honestly, that was one of the things that I really didn't care for, but the mechanics were so tight in this game, and I'm really glad to see that they took those mechanics and put it in a brand new game. So that is the Manhattan Project Energy Empire, and it's coming out this year. And now, at the table with BGA. We want to talk about a couple of games that we got to the table and let you know if they're a buy and you should run out right now and grab these games. Or if they're a play and you should definitely sit down and see if you like them. A dodge, which you should avoid that table at all costs. Or the dreaded bird. And this game does not belong in our industry at all. So let's start off with Anthony and see what he's got to the table this week. In addition to Power Grid Deluxe which we've reviewed Power Grid in the past, so I'm not going to go through that again, although it was awesome. Uh, did get the chance to play a couple of smaller games. Uh, talk about both of those here. The first of them is the hotness of hotnesses right now. Super hard to find, but uh, somebody in the game group had a copy, so we got to play Codenames. This is the new party game from Vrada Uh and it is, it is actually pretty good. I was impressed. I don't generally like party games, but this one was fun, and it's really about the experience, which... I know a lot of people say that about every party game, and it's not always true, and it depends on the group, but in this case, it really is. The game itself is very simple. You have all these words on the table and two rival spy masters, so each team's going to have one person who's in charge of giving the clues, and each of those cards will correspond to one side of the table or the other, so red spies or blue spies, and mixed in there, there's an assassin as well. And the goal is to... You're going to get these cards that kind of highlight different cards that you need to uh, give clues for to the, to your team. And what you need to do is give a one-word clue that will help them figure out which cards you're talking about. So if it's like four cards on the table, you need to think of a word that's going to apply to those four cards. And then your team has to figure out which cards are most likely to relate to that. There's no direction giving. There's only that one word. So there's no weird like having to guess how much information to give or not give. It's very strict about how much information to give. And once that one word is given, uh, the team tends to devolve into minor bickering trying to figure out which words are or not fitting that clue. Now, you have to pick at least one of the cards, but you can pick more than one if you want. What I found is usually it's pretty easy to find one. It's There's going to be one that's pretty obvious that matches the clue. So maybe the clue is, you know, cycle and you know some of the cards that might match that are you know bicycle and merry-go-round or carousel something like that and you're like okay well obviously that's something that goes around in a circle but then there might also be something like you know software and like okay i guess i get it the software life cycle, you know something like that where it doesn't really fit but they're trying to find a way to get that word to apply to all of the different cards that are on the table the reason this is important and the reason you want to be careful uh picking more than one when it's your turn to guess is that the assassin is on the table. And if you pick the assassin, you just lose. So you don't want to guess randomly. At the same time, if you pick a card that belongs to the other team, you don't get those points and they do. So the first team to kind of clear their, their cards on the board is going to win. And I've heard a lot of disagreement on how many players to play this with. Um, It seems like the sweet spot is five or six. So you get teams of, 
two people trying to guess the clues of one spy master. We played with a crazy number of people in one of the games, I think 10, and it played fine. I think the box might even say it only goes up to eight, but the 10 was fine. I think it's really going to depend on the group for the most part, and you probably need an even number of players, so you have even sides. But it really doesn't matter in the end because it's just guessing. It's almost like charades, but on these cards. It was a lot of fun. I was surprised. As far as party games go, it's a pretty good one. The other game we got to the table kind of in the other 15 minutes of that 30-minute block is The Game. This is the very small profile card game that got nominated for one of the Spiel Just Yards Awards earlier this year. And everybody's like, what is that game? And why does it have that weird horror artwork on it? I can't answer the second question. I played the game, still have no idea why it has these weird horror, <laughs> horror images on the cards. But the game itself is pretty interesting. What you have is a number of cards, number between 1 and 100. Everybody has a hand of cards, and it's cooperative. And you're basically all trying to get all of your cards onto the table um, before the end of the game. You're going to put your cards in one of four deck, four stacks on the table. Two of the stacks are going down from 100, and two of them are going up from 1. And the goal is to get them all the cards out. I think you need to have less than 10 cards left total. Uh, from the draw pile and everybody's hands to even consider it a win. And it seems really easy at first. It gets much, much harder as you go along. Um, the one quirk to the game is that if you play a card that's 10 different than the current card on that pile, so let's say the card is you're going down from 100 and it's a 55, you could play a 65 and bring that number back up a little bit to give yourself a little more room. So the single piece of information you can share with each other is don't play on that pile. Uh, the assumption being that I have a good card that I want to put there, but you can't say what it is. You can't say I can increase it or I have the next number in the sequence. And sometimes people just ignore you because they don't have a choice. So they're like, well, I also have a really good card and I don't know how good your card is, which adds a little bit of frustration to it. It reminded me a lot of Hanabi. It's got similar mechanics, but it's not quite as funky because you don't have to be so careful about what people can see and what they can't see i like it better than hanabi for that reason it's if it had cleaner and more family-friendly artwork and it's it's not gory or weird or bad artwork it's just strange there's no reason for it to look like this you could almost reskin it any way you want i think somebody at the table was saying you could play this game with uh, a copy of six nymphed so you could even pick that up and play the game using that or you could use index cards honestly because it's just a bunch of cards with numbers on them, um, but it was enjoyable. It is something that if it ever manages to make it here from Germany, I, I might pick up a copy because it's cheap and quick and fun. So code names for me, that's a definite play, and the game is a borderline buy. So Chris, what did you get to the table this week? Well, I was able to get a abstract to the table. Now, I'm not a big fan of abstracts. I like a couple. I'm pretty picky when it comes to that. So when someone said at our game group that they were going to play Samurai, I was like, cool, I love Samurais, that's awesome. And they were like, it's from Rider Knizia. I'm like, yeah, I like Rider Knizia. And then I saw the pieces and it was an abstract. And I was like, I gotta go. <laughs> but thankfully, I st stuck around and I did play Samurai. And I gotta tell you, I love this game. And it was a complete surprise to me because, as I said, I am not generally an abstract guy. And a Kinesia game typically is these hardcore abstract games with a little theme kind of pasted on top. Now, Samurai is set in medieval Japan. And when you look at the board, you get this beautiful kind of piece together puzzle of Japan with a little water kind of going around the sides. And you are going to get a color... And your player color is going to have three different types of factions. So There's going to be the samurais, the peasants, and the priests. Which are represented by the helmets, the rice patties, and the Buddha tokens. But that's not important. Once again, this is an abstract. Now, what was interesting about this game is when it's set up, you are going to see that there is placed on the board these three different shapes. That, as I said, before, present the three different quote-unquote characters in this game. And your job, and in conjunction with other players, is to surround these pieces on the board. And then whoever has the greatest number power of that matching item wins that piece. Once one of those items is completely wiped off the board because they've been captured by everybody else, the game stops and you see who wins. 
Now, there's a couple of different winning conditions based upon who has three of each or who has the two of the most or one of the most. But the important part of this game is you are basically playing tiles from behind a screen. So everyone has the same tile. So it has the same numbers, but obviously as you're kind of pulling these from this random pile behind your board, you are getting these different symbol tiles with a certain number that represents its power. There are also some special tiles that kind of move things around where you can place the tiles somewhere else or you can move the tokens around. There's a Ronin tile, which is kind of like these wild tiles that'll be able to give power to a certain area. So they kind of work with everything, but they tend to be a little bit weak. There's also ships that tend to be weak, but you can play them on the outside. And once again, they give you an additional boost. As I said, it's it's a really strange experience. And I got to say, it's been a while since I had an experience with gaming that I just actually sat down and just even in the first round, I was like, wow, I'm having fun. This This is actually fun. And it was so much fun that I really wasn't thinking about strategy here. And I was just kind of throwing down some tiles and collecting some pieces. It's fun. It's simple. It's easy to teach. It plays well with a number of different players. There's going to be a reprint from Fantasy Flight. But honestly, if you pick up the original, you're absolutely fine. Either way, it works for you. It plays probably in about a half hour to 45 minutes. Maybe if you're a hardcore player, you can kind of like really strategize what tiles to play and based upon what you're going to get in your hand. But it's an abstract. It's tactical. This game is a buy. I'm not sure if I'm going to try to pick up the original version or the Fantasy Flight version. But either way, check out Samurai. That's great. I actually saw this at uh, Gen Con. The Fantasy Flight was demoing their uh, new version. And it looked cool, but I knew nothing about it. So I did not pick it up. Um, I am now interested. Yeah, this game is something that kind of went beneath my radar. I'd heard it here and there, and especially being in a Knizia game, it's like, oh, it's one of his thousand of other abstract games. But it plays really well, really quick, really simple, and that's what you want from an abstract game. It's fun. So, yeah, check it out. And now, BGA's feature review. We are mega-sizing our acquisition disorder, and we're going German, my friends, with Essen 2015 Preview. Now, there are so many games to talk about here. This is Essen. This is the big gamer trade show. Now, over the last several weeks in our acquisition disorder corner, we've been talking about a lot of these Essen games that are coming out that we want to play. So for this episode, and especially this feature, we wanted to highlight some of the games that we've been looking at over the last several weeks and really pinpoint the ones that we think that you should get to the table as soon as possible. So, Daniel, why don't you start us off? Guten Tag, die spielen sehr gut. Nah, I got nothing. I don't, I don't know German, but you said we're going German, so I was like, I should, I should try to riff. I you know, should try like, to, do you know some German, right? Die spielen sehr gut. I feel like that means the games are very good, or die sehr gut. I don't know much, any German. We have a lot of German listeners. They'll let us know if it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Anthony, I can tell you right now, it's wrong. <laughs> you don't need to tell us. I know a lot of German existentialism. I don't know if that's going to help. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so I've got my my three pulled out these these standouts from the generally excellent lineup of games coming out at Essen. Um, fudging it a little bit, and that one or two of these has had quite a lot of buzz elsewhere already. But you know, whatever, who cares? Uh, so my favorite, uh, my first one, uh, and probably the one that sticks out the most to me is Pandemic Legacy. We've talked about this a bit already about how awesome this is going to be, and we kind of. Broke the news here at BoardGamersAnonymous.com, so, you know, yeah, you guys can't see, but I just did that, like, brush your shoulder thing, where you're like, yeah, I'm awesome, yeah, that's that's how that goes. Anyway, um, I'm a big fan of cooperative games, particularly Pandemic, uh, and I love the Legacy me- mechanic. I played Risk Legacy quite a bit, and I really enjoyed that. It made me, in fact, enjoy a game, Risk, that I pretty much hate, which is remarkable. Uh, and for me, it has a special value potentially in that uh, both my mother and uh, my girlfriend are both uh, public health professionals. And I really want to get this game and sit down and play through the entire thing with them just in a week or something. I right? just play right through it uh, just to see what their feelings are about it. I have played Pandemic with them and 
my mom was de- uh, pointing out that it was depressingly accurate, <laughs> um, which, you know, but it, it adds a level of enjoyment to the game when you have people like that there, uh, as well as being just apparently a, a totally fantastic game and an excellent idea. And one of those things that was pretty obviously going to happen from years on out. And uh, this is one of those ones that was called, I think, like five years ago. People were like, ah, oh, Pandemic Legacy is going to happen. It's going to happen. Not that long ago, but, you know, hyperbole. Yeah. So my uh, so that's Pandemic Legacy, which is the first one on my Essen Acquisition Disorder list. Uh, the next one is Mysterium, which is a cooperative game where one player is a ghost and the rest of the players are psychics uh, who are receiving messages from this ghost and their dreams. Uh, and the ghost is trying to reveal to them a mystery, and particularly a murder mystery, uh, one for which they were wrongly blamed. And it's an interesting combination of Clue, Dixit, and a cooperative mechanic. Because you you communicate as the ghost by handing psychics these Dixit-style illustrations. And then they have to infer from that information, that sort of very limited information, what exactly really happened that night, right? Uh, and that's just such an interesting way to deal with things that I really want to give it a shot. Uh, and also my our, our really good experience with Tragedy Looper has got me interested in games where you have essentially cooperative games, but one player sort of sitting out and doing something else. In this case, they're actually still on your team, unlike Tragedy Looper, where they're trying to kill you. But still, it's it's an interesting idea, right? Having that sort of very asymmetric cooperative game. So Mysterium is another one I'm very excited for. Uh, the last one, and the one I'm least well acquainted with, is going to be Steampunk Rally. Steampunk-themed racing game, uh, which features as characters people like Nikola Tesla, and Madame Curie uh, in a exotic race where they are slapping together flying machines as they go, having them fall apart underneath them and putting them back together again. The big reason I want to go for this is I have a difficult relationship with racing games. And in fact, the only one that I really like is Gravwell, which I love. And it's, as any of you who have played that will recognize, an incredibly unorthodox racing game. Steampunk Rally seems like a chance to have something more like an orthodox racing game, but with enough substance and mechanical twist to it to make it something that could be really a lot of fun. The art style is also nice, though I will admit I'm a little tired of steampunk stuff in general. I do think that the theme lends itself nicely to a steampunk environment, rather the mechanics lend itself nicely to a steampunk environment. It appears to fit quite a bit better than many of the steampunk stuffs we see out there, which are kind of slapped on, right? Uh, so those are my three. Pandemic Legacy, Mysterium, and Steampunk Rally. How about you, Anthony? What are you looking forward to from Essen? Oh, man. So the list for this was so long. Uh, <laughs> just an endless list, including a couple that Daniel mentioned and a couple that he mentioned earlier today, and then a handful that got mentioned previous episodes the list goes on and on and on and on um, but i did narrow it down to three that i have not yet talked about on the podcast that i'm very uh, excited about the first of which is antarctica from charles chevalier Chev- i'm gonna i'm sure i'm butchering the name and i do apologize this is the designer of abyss uh, one of last year's big hits and the game itself like i didn't know anything about it when i first saw the board i was just intrigued and too bad drew is not here because it does have a rondelle um, an Antarctic rondelle, even. And the whole concept of the game is, it's interesting. I can't tell if it's, uh, you know, a political statement about climate change or just an interesting uh, you know, treatise or thought on what it would be like in the future if climate change, you know, does affect the world in, in a significant way. And if we start going to Antarctica to do various things. The game itself, though, the actual mechanics, the part that matters, is... You have eight spaces around Antarctica, and on any given turn, the sun will only be in one of those places. And when it's on that space, the ice melts a little bit, which means the ships there can move. And they can move to different spaces on the board and perform actions there based on that space. As you move your 
pieces around the board and they get activated by the sun and you're able to perform these different actions. You can build different things, but building different things requires that you have ships in various locations. The game ends once you get all of your people out on the board or if you get all of your buildings constructed, both of which appear to be relatively hard to do. Um, the scoring at the end of the game is also very interesting. It has to do with the people who have the lead in the area as well as the leader in the area and what their score is. There's a lot of things going on here, but really when you look at the board, you look at that full board size rondelle and the mechanic of that sun moving around the board, melting the ice. And then there are a few ways to kind of break through that using the icebreaker card, because there are cards in the game that will give you special actions and etc. It looks very cool. It is coming out at Essen. Uh, Passport Game Studios will be doing it here in the U.S., so we will get this game at some point. I'm excited to see it. That's about all I know about it at this point, but it does look very interesting. And um, as I said, Drew will be excited. It's got a rondelle. So that's the first one. The second game that I'm interested in that is going to be out at Essen is Signori. This is a new game from the designer of Kingsburg and Hyperborea, uh, Arcanum, a couple of other games that came out recently that did very well. And it has a combination of a number of different mechanics. The, the idea of the game... And as you might imagine from somebody who designed Kingsburg, it has dice uh, as well as variable player powers. And it's a worker placement game with some hand management uh, mixed in there for good measure. So during the game, you're going to be able to choose a die from a common pool. There's going to be 20 different dice and five different colors at the beginning of any one round. Um, you're going to play it on your own board, which is your city. And it's your unique board with special powers that only you can use. And then the, the actual color of the die you choose is going to determine the action that you're able to take, as well as the number on the die is going to determine the discount on the action um, itself. So you're going to get four different actions per turn and the, or per round. And at the end of the round, you're going to sum up the dice that you have. If it's less than 13, you can get a reward as well. So there's a lot of different things going on here. I like the idea of dice's actions, dice's movement. Um, it works really well in Kingsburg. It works really well in Marco Polo. And it allows a lot of cool ways to mitigate luck, but also introduce luck to some degree into a Euro. And I feel like Kingsburg, again, is one of the games that does that, you know, the best um, of any that I've played in recent years. And I'm excited to see how this one does the same. So that's one that's going to be out at Essen, and it'll be exciting to see kind of how that one pans out as well. The last game on my list here uh, that I was interested in is Shakespeare. And as an English major, of course, I you know, was immediately drawn to anything called Shakespeare. It doesn't mean it's good, but it means I'll read the entry on it and see what I can find out. It also plays with as few as one players, which is always interesting to me. Um, although I'm not quite sure how the solo variant works because it is an auction bidding game uh, and with card drafting. So we'll see how that actually works out, what kind of variants are required there. The idea of the game, though, is that you are a theater manager who is recruiting all the various roles needed to put on a performance. So you're recruiting actors, craftsmen, jewelers, and all these other people that you need basically to put on the best possible show. So the, day, the game's going to last over the course of six different days. Each day you're going to recruit a different character. Um, there are going to be five at the beginning of the game. And then there are going to be four specifically on your individual player board and then one that you'll draft. You'll be taking actions based on which characters are available to you and then kind of see the level that, of impact this has on your um, theater. So you're going to gain or lose points um, depending on the atmosphere of the theater. If people are happy, if they're excited about the show, if they're a little down, you might gain or lose rehearsal time. Um, if your show is well rehearsed, you're going to earn extra points and money. So it's really taking the entire theater experience from putting on the show to preparing for it to actually presenting it and assigning points and different values to that. At the end of everything, you have to pay those actors. And if you're unable to pay those actors, so, you know, it can hurt your reputation and cost you points. We'll see how much of an impact that actually has on the game because I'm not always a huge fan of games where you do a lot of cool stuff and then get dinged really hard because you forgot to do, you know, spend a bunch of stuff at some point to keep people happy. <clears throat> Agricola. We'll see how that goes. It can be done well. I like the theme, though, and it'll be interesting to see if this does actually mix in any Shakespeare lore or anything interesting from the Bard's plays or if it's, you know, kind of a generic theaters in London at that time period, um, which... Honestly, I'd be cool with that, too. I mean, it's a very interesting time period in which 
so much happened in the English theater. Um, it'd be fun to play a game based on that. So that's Shakespeare. That's also going to be out at Essen. I'm excited to see that one when it makes its way over here. Uh, Chris, what about you? What three games are you excited for? Well, I'm going to jump right back to what we were talking about in our acquisition disorder. And I mean by that our spinoff games. Now, I've talked about this game a number of times. And as we're getting closer and closer to Essen, we are getting a better view of Seven Wonders Duel. Now, this is not an expansion for Seven Wonders, but a legitimate spinoff, a two-player Seven Wonders game. Now, the original Seven Wonders game did play as a two-player, but let's be honest, it really didn't play well as a two-player. Now, what we have here is an actual two-player game. And now that we can actually see pictures, it's amazing. Now, there is a main board that's almost like a little bit of a tug-of-war where you have this military figure in the middle, and as one civilization side or another builds up military, it pulls that figure across the board, and it does damage to that player. Now, if that figure happens to get all the way to one end, it's a military victory, and the player wins. But there's also an opportunity for a scientific victory. If a player collects all of the scientific tokens, they win the game. Now, there's also point scoring in this game, too. So there's actually three different ways to win this game. Now, what's interesting about this game is you're not just getting one wonder, but at the beginning of the, of the game, there's going to be four wonders to choose from. The first player takes one, then the second player takes two, then the first player takes the last one. And then you go around and around, you do the same with four more wonders, and then eventually you'll have eight wonders. So as the game goes around, you'll be able to pick from those wonders, dispose of wonders, build up wonders using the cards in this pyramid-like tableau. You pick one card, you pick another card, and then one of those face-down cards is now revealed and that becomes available. So there is a little bit of strategy and tactics going on here on what do you want to make available for the other civilizations. I've always loved Seven Wonders. It's one of my top games. It plays so well. It's sleek. It's brilliant. And I don't know what you could ask for more in a two-player game, especially in a civilization game that plays so incredibly well. I'm looking forward to this game. This is an instant pickup, and I can't wait to get this to the table. Now, another game that I really am looking forward to from Essen is Russian Railroad's German Railroads. Now, Anthony talked about this in a previous episode, and I happen to be a big fan of Russian Railroads. But for me personally, I felt that the game bogged down with there was always a best decision to be made and then some secondary and third and so forth and so on. So if you didn't get to choose first, you always lost out. So when Russian Railroads has been hitting the table around me, I've been avoiding it because I felt like I played the factory strategy and I played certain of the track strategies and I felt like I played the game out and there really wasn't anything else to play in this game. Now, thankfully, it seems like I've been hurt a little bit, and Russian Railroads and German Railroads is the first expansion that is actually going to open the game up. So first off, there's the German game board. It's a brand new board with new routes, and it's also going to have new strategies to follow. So you're not kind of locked down to those one or two best moves. It's going to allow you to do different things. The distances are not fixed. It means there's a lot of options to this game, and some even additional little mini boards that go onto your main tableau board, which will open up new tracks. There's also a coal age, which is another module to the game that you can add. Now, this is interesting because this is using coal as a resource. Now, you can use the coal to improve locomotives, factories, and can also be used in foundries. I like this idea that they're expanding just beyond moving the track and you're actually using the raw materials that are used in a locomotive type of factory. So it's really interesting here. Now, finally, and I think most importantly, and I know Anthony's going to love this, there is a single ticket mode. This is a solo version. Now, when I played the first Russian Railroads, I thought this would be an outstanding single player game because there were certain tracks to victory that if you could have the opportunity just to play by yourself maybe against you know the the against the board game ai you could really kind of 
you know, grind out a great victory. And here it is, a solo version to this game. So I'm really looking forward to Russian Railroads, German Railroads. Now, finally, I wanted to talk about a game that at the beginning of the year, Drew and I kind of fought back and forth on this on our predictions for 2015-2016. Now, it may seem fun to be on a podcast, but it turns out to be very expensive when you have all of these other hosts telling you about these great games. Now, last week it was, and then we held hands. Yeah, Daniel talked me into it and I backed it. Well, another interesting, strange game just like that one that I felt like I needed to play. This one is 504, the Freeman Freeze game. I can't possibly see this game working out. And yet, I am drawn to this game like like you can't believe. Now, this game has nine different modules, pick up and deliver, race, privileges, military, exploration, roads, majorities, production, and shares. And based upon the three different modules that you are going to engage in this game, you can add up to 504 games. Now, I don't know if there's going to be anybody in the world who's going to play all 504, but... I'm assuming Freeman Freeze did it because he brought us 504 games here. Now, there's pictures of the components. Now, they're slightly basic and a little bit cartoony, which was kind of surprising. But I am still holding out great hope that somehow, some way, 504 works out because as someone who's a meetup organizer for gaming, I would love to be able to bring one game each and every week, drop it at the table and go, all right, what do you guys want to play? Oh, you really need to pick up and deliver? Okay, we'll throw that in. Ooh, you want to do some military? That's great. Oh, you want to add some special abilities? Let's do that. And then kind of put together a brand new game each and every time. Now, I am a little bit worried about how the rules come into play here or if the components become a little boring after a while. But nonetheless, 504, if this game even has a handful of, of decent games, it's going to be an outstanding achievement, and I can't wait to play it. And now, our final round. Hey guys, I'm back. Yay, um, Drew's back! <laughs> Woo! I, I lost Australia to the Ruskies, but you know, I never did like Fosters anyway, so no big loss. Alright. Let's get to the final <laughs> round. You know, there was one news item I didn't include in the Twitter feed because it just made a passing reference to board games. It was describing a parish school's environmental fair. A British newspaper described the event as having short presentations, networking opportunities, and they, quote, unfair board games. And that's all they said about it. They didn't say what unfair board games they were playing, but (laughs) there was something unfair about them. So it just got me to thinking, what is unfair about board games or board gaming? And, And I think we've all felt those things from time to time especially in Risk, love playing Risk, and especially if you have six people playing Risk and you're the last person to play, it's just not fair. And games, some games nowadays are good at balancing uh, players who go last, giving them a little more in resources, but there's still some games where you're penalized, like Risk. I think it's very unfair. Daniel, is there anything you find unfair in games? Well, for me, it's probably going to have to be like the first round knockout or, in fact, any sudden player elimination moment where the game goes from, oh, we're just kind of chugging along. Oh, I'm out. (laughs) Well, okay. Uh, And I don't know if it's technically unfair because, right, it follows the rules of the game and in that sense is fair. But it sucks. It's a terrible idea. And, of course, the, the most prominent villain here is going to be something like Werewolf, but usually it doesn't, you know, Werewolf doesn't last long enough for you to really mind, though longer games where you've got like 30 people playing the really big version would be frustrating as heck. That's a good way to find out which of your friends you pissed off most recently uh, as they just arbitrarily decide, eh, I think you need to die. <laughs> Why? Um, so I'm, I'm really not a fan of any of those sudden knockouts. I like there to be a, uh, a struggle. I like there to be a constant, consistent battle, and if it goes suddenly, oh, and now you're out. Yeah, it's true. If you come to a game night and you want to have a lot of fun with your friends and you're just going to sit around for an hour and a half, yeah, Yeah, that's not fair. It's a mix of player elimination and radical swinginess at once. 
that really gets me, right? When you can not only lose because of one turn, but you can actually be forced to sit on the sideline for the next hour and a half because oh, just the die rolled wrong. Yeah. And it's, that's a problem. Hey, Anthony, what do you think is unfair in gaming? I don't know if it's unfair so much as just poor design, but maybe that's the same as Daniel's. But I think my uh, dislike for trick-taking games has been pretty well documented. And to me, I think it's just... It's luck of the draw, roll of the dice, whatever it is. Situations in games where if you pull the wrong cards or roll the dice wrong, you just can't do anything. I don't like situations where you're sitting there unable to do anything because that's just how the game goes. Um, I like there to be some mitigation of that. Now, I'm not saying I don't like luck in games. And sometimes even if you can't do something, it's still fun. Like, I like diamonds, as a trick-taking game, because even when you can't do anything, you can do something. There needs to be a way to make sure it's still fun and the decision still matters. And it, there's a reason for me to be sitting at the table, except as a thing to poke at if you're the other players with much better cards than I have. So yeah, once again, trick-taking games suck. Uh, what was uh, the question again? Oh, <laughs> if it's unfair. And, and <laughs> really, if, you, if you've got a good... You know, game engine going, and you're you're chugging along, and you're scoring points, and something random—the dice or the the cards—destroy all that. Don't you think that's unfair? Yeah, I agree with you, Chris. What's unfair? Well, it's unfair when you are against friends with game benefits. Now, this comes into play in a lot of different games. So, the typical situation you're going to run into is when you're playing a party game, and you're playing against let's say, spouses or just really close friends or new people to the game that know each other. And they're like, all right, so I'm going to give you a clue. And it only could be these three words. And you got to try to figure it out. And there's all these extra things. And they're like, Uncle Harry's pet. And they're like, oh, iguana. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I had no, I didn't know who Uncle Harry was. That's not fair. Or if you're playing a game like Small World, and you are counting on everyone to keep everybody else in check, and they're not going to attack each other because they're friends, and it's adorable, and they like each other, and they don't want to do that. But the game is requiring you to do that. So the whole game, you're like, come on, you got to attack him. He's way out in the lead. They're like, no, he built such a beautiful little kingdom. I really don't want to step all over it. And you're like, but, but. Two, two hours, two, two, two hours for the game and nothing, no, nothing, not even a little bit. And they're like, no, oh, no. And you're like, all right. So, yes, friends with game benefits is a real unfair advantage in gaming. <laughs> That's a new thing you just came up with. I did. Friends with game benefits. Okay. Watch out for them, people. They'll ruin your games. Well, so that must be what this newspaper was referring to when they said unfair board games. That's our final round for this week. All right, so that's everything for this week. Please keep in contact with us on Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. And if you can, just like Zane did, if you would please take a look at our Patreon account. The more that you back us, the more we can do to bring players into our wonderful gaming hobby. Until next time, this is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Daniel. And this is Drew. We'll save you a seat with us at Essen 2015.